Welcome to the Ocean Forum. Prior to the opening of the program, Dr. Atsushi Tsunami, president of Sasagawa Peace Foundation and the president of OPRI, is going to welcome you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Atsushi Tsunami, President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation and President of Ocean Policy Research Institute. State of emergency due to COVID has been declared and extended for Tokyo and other major urban areas in Japan. The situation remains difficult, but I'd like to express appreciation to medical health care providers and all other essential workers for their dedication to support our lives. I hope you will stay safe and healthy and overcome the difficulties we are facing. I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's first Ocean Forum perspectives from the front line of IUU fishing, international partnership and challenges. We've decided not to suspend our research dialogue and other activities, but we are restrained by uncertainty and certain restrictions. I appreciate your understanding in this regard. As you know, eliminating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing is an important task for us to achieve a sustainable ocean and conserve marine resources and secure, assure our food security. The economic loss of IUU fishing is estimated to account for 23 billion US dollars annually, and it can be 8 billion US dollars in the Pacific region alone. The international community must reinforce its efforts by implementing the post port state measures agreement and related policy instruments and mechanisms. Japan adopted a new legislation last December called the Act for the Improvement of Domestic Trade and Specific Marine Animals and Plants Act as an effort to eliminate the seafood caught by IUU fishing in the Japanese market. I'm grateful that uh, Mr. Ian uh, Urbina, an award-winning investigative journalist of the New York Times, is joining us today to give his talk and have a discussion with Japanese colleagues regarding IUU fishing and its ecological, social, economic implications. I hope that today's discussion will further inspire us and reinvigorate our efforts to eliminate IUU fishing and strengthen international partnership. Our OPRI and uh, Sasaga Peace Foundation will continue to work with diverse stakeholders to tackle the challenges that our society faces by striving towards achieving peace and prosperity of the world, including stakeholder inclusiveness, gender equality, and the sustainable ocean. I thank you again for joining us today. I wish you all that the year 2021 will be fruitful to you. I look forward to furthering collaboration with you. Thank you. Now I'd like to move on to the main part of the program. The moderator uh, with us today is Masanori Kobayashi, Senior Research Fellow of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you all. I'm Masanori Kobayashi, Senior Research Fellow of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I welcome you all to the 178th Ocean Forum, Perspectives from the Frontline of IUU Fishing, International Partnership and Challenges. We have a distinct pleasure to welcome outstanding journalist, Mr. Ian Avina, investigative uh, reporter of the New York Times, who will tell us about what he has witnessed during his investigative reporting on IUU fishing around the world. After listening to his talk, we will have a panel of discussions with three Japanese colleagues, as well as a colleague of 
the outer ocean project. He is well known worldwide. His book Outer Ocean was published in English and translated into nine other languages. The Japanese version of his book is forthcoming this May that we certainly look forward to. I remember uh, two years ago when I went to Palau, I had a chance to visit a remote island called Kayangel and I met a gentleman who was working there as a ranger to patrol coastal areas and uh, he was actually telling me the vis about the visit of Ian to Kayangel at that time. So I was very surprised and at the same time that also told me and tells us that he has traveled around the world to document IUU fishing. So may I invite Ian and thank you indeed for joining us to tell us about what was your motive to initiate and undertake your investigative reporting on IUU fishing and I'm um, sure that you have a lot to tell us but um, as we are located in Asia and the Pacific, uh, maybe it would be good to hear more about your stories in Asia and the Pacific that are in our proximity. So may I invite Ian to take a floor and proceed with your talk. So Ian, uh, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thanks also for having me here today. Um, so my plan will be to start with the big picture uh, and offer a broad view at the outset um, about the outlaw ocean, what were its motives, its methodologies, its outcomes um, as a journalistic project. And then um, my goal would be to move to maybe three stories in particular uh, that offer a bit of a sense for how these issues played out in our reporting. Um, as was mentioned, I've been a journalist with the New York Times on staff for about 20 years. And um, my mandate as an investigative reporter uh, is to find uh, virgin snow, you know, topically, to find topics, um, subject matter that either haven't been covered before or are old topics that be, can be approached in a new way. And ideally to find things that are uh, broken uh, in the world and shed light on them with the hope that um, that attention will help fix those things. And so the Owl Ocean started from that place, that mission, uh, and in essence was an attempt to reimagine the part of the planet that is water, the two thirds of, of, the, of the surface that is water, and to think of that space um, uh, as a frontier, if you will, um, uh, a realm where um, a lot happens, but we rarely hear much in the way of news from this realm, this watery frontier. Um, and also to think about this space, not just as a marine or environmental story, but also as a human story. Um, to, think of the, uh, to think of the oceans in the broadest sense of the world as the lungs of the planet producing 50% of the air we breathe, um, a major source of protein for, for many coastal nations, um, a bustling workplace, you know, where more than 50 million people work. Um, and to some degree, the, the circulatory system of the, of the, of, of the world's commerce, you know, in, in the sense that 90% of the products we consume comes by way of ship and therefore is traversing this space. And yet the journalism about these people and about the activities and about the environmental story out there um, was woefully lacking. There was really good academic and advocacy work done on the oceans, but more often than not, it was only environmental in focus. And more often than not, it wasn't being covered um, in a narrative, investigative, evocative way in journalism that in my view, drives change. So um, the goal was to approach journalistically the space. Now, IUU, illegal fishing under reported um, unregulated fishing, um, is certainly a part of that. But the view we had was that uh, only by 
offering a bigger picture and framing IUU within the context of a broader diversity of crimes and placing it on a spectrum of other sorts of behaviors out there, only then would the public writ large, the global public, uh, feel a sense of urgency, a sense of complicity, a sense of relevance to what's happening out there, leaving this space as one that's largely defined by marine life only or or IUU stories strictly was probably, in our view, not going to be enough to move the meter. So um, that was the ambition. Methodologically, um, the journalism, which again started for two years in the New York Times and then culminated in two more years of reporting at sea for the book, and then since then has been going on for uh, additional and is ongoing now, additional uh, two years. Um, this reporting all fits within the framework of a look at the, the sort of woeful lack of governance at sea and the sort of subsidiary consequences of that lack of governance. Why isn't there more governance out there? Um, why is policing what few laws exist? Why is policing of those laws so rare and difficult? Um, and what are the diversity of nefarious um, behaviors out there? So alongside reporting about um, illegal fishing, which which the stories um, focused on, we have stories of human slavery, often referred to as sea slavery, stories of uh, repo men or, or these individuals who steal ships on behalf of, of banks and mortgage loan um, companies, um, stories of seafarer abandonment, um, stories of, of um, bycatch, shark finning, uh, stories of intentional dumping of oil and other forms of intentional pollution at sea, stories of armed trafficking, human trafficking, um, stories of murder of stowaway, stories of murder of people that are even caught on camera and yet no governments prosecute, a wide diversity of crimes. Um, so these were the ambitions topically. Um, methodologically, the journalism meant to not report the stories on shore but as much as possible, always report the stories at sea. So in other words, really take the extra effort to get onto the vessels uh, and report on them so that you could give readers a more vicarious five senses um, feel for what this world is like. Um, so uh, I, I, would, I would shift to say, um, perhaps um, maybe we can talk about, or I can talk about uh, three stories in particular, um, two that were part of the core original reporting in the book, and then one that um, uh, we produced, we being me and my team uh, produced in the last year um, uh, since the book. So first I'd like to um, touch on a story about Palau. Um, the, Palau is, um, as many of you already know, is uh, um, in some ways a quintessential island nation in that it's um, small, it's a developing nation, a small population. Um, a lot of its uh, domestic economy depends on tourism and quite especially marine tourism. In the case of Palau, a lot of shark um, scuba diving. Um, uh, uh, so a, a very ocean dependent nation, uh, but also a nation that has a unusual skewing of in the proportion of its land mass to its sea area. So Palau has the island and land territory of, to make a U.S. reference, um, the city of Philadelphia. Um, so a small U.S. urban city on the one hand, but it has the sea space under its territorial jurisdiction of France, so a large European nation. Um, and yet Palau for many years had only one patrol vessel um, to attempt to protect that huge uh, seascape, to protect the marine life um, from illegal fishing, industrial fishing, um, often incursions by foreign um, industrial boats. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, a lot of support has come from uh, Japan in particular and Nippon Foundation um, in trying to help Palau um, better police its waters. But in Palau, you had this standard challenge where they were under equipped to actually protect their waters, but over dependent on those very same waters for their protein source and for their economy. 
Um, and they also were in a place in the world where they were a magnet for large fleets, Taiwanese, South Korean, um, Chinese, um, were routinely entering these waters um, with impunity uh, and illegally. Uh, and so you had this David and Goliath kind of struggle in Palau, um, where uh, the challenge of protecting those waters was severe. Um, I wanted to tell the story of what it was like for the 17 officers who work that one patrol vessel in this sort of Sisyphean um, impossible challenge of policing the waters. And um, also a good news story in the sense of Japan, Australia, the US in terms of governments, um, an NGO called the Pew Charitable Trust and some other NGOs, Nippon Foundation, um, had all come together uh, to attempt to help Palau and other island nations um, better use alternate methods of policing such as satellite technology um, so that they could have a more targeted approach. Whenever there were incursions, it was possible to see with help from what is still expensive satellite monitoring um, the incursion. But the, the next steps were always the hard ones. Dispatching a ship so as to go engage that uh, intruder uh, was one option, an expensive, time-consuming, often an effective option, but also figuring out how to alert the other nations where that ship that had, that fishing vessel that had just entered Palauan waters was headed next, usually to unload their illegal catch. That sort of um, relationship building um, and work between the Palauan military and the Palauan government and other nations that were going to be complicit in the illegal fishing that was going on was something that took a lot of effort, you know, building the relationships and the sort of protocol for um, providing evidence that could then convince these other governments to seize that ship or, or, or halt it from unloading its catch. And that sort of coalition building and that sort of reliance on other nations to, cha to tackle IUU uh, was, I think, one of the most important lessons um, from the reporting in Palau. Um, uh, so Palau, I think, is the story of Kiribati, is the story of many island nations, Fiji, um, where they are up against severe challenges and only with international help do they have any chance of countering the onslaught of um, illegal fishing. Um, a second story line of reporting that's been ongoing is the story of the South China Sea and more specifically of sea slavery at, as it existed in the Thai fleet on the South China Sea. And this, I think, is a, a hugely important um, issue. The problem of debt bonded or trafficked or captive or otherwise abused workers on fishing vessels, be they legal fishing vessels or illegal fishing vessels. But the human story um, within the distant water fishing fleets and um, the, the very ingrained um, problems within that workforce that, that really actually, it's hard to think of other global workforces that have conditions as bad as these um, distant water fishing fleets do. And um, I, I, I say that not bombastically, you look at some of the really good academic research that's been done on, for example, murder on uh, distant water fishing fleets, um, you know, there was a UN study from two, 2009 that interviewed Cambodian deckhands on Thai fishing vessels, uh, and they found that 49% um, of those deckhands had directly witnessed murder of other crew. Um, so I don't know that you can find another line of work that has these sorts of statistics. The Thai fleet in particular is one that we looked at, not because we uh, it's the only place where sea slavery exists, but because it's a particularly illustrative, illustrative example. In the Thai fleet on the, South China, uh, on the South China Sea, you have a couple of important factors. One is you have a fleet that has resisted mechanization um, and it is woefully um, bloated. There are simply too many boats within the Thai fleet for uh, healthy competition to exist. And so the competition between Thai vessels, even in nearshore waters, not to mention distant waters, um, is 
is very acute. And that means the profit margins that are possible within that fleet are slimmer. And that means that when 40% of your overhead in a, on a fishing vessel, especially on a distant water fishing vessel, is manpower, um, that's one of the few places where you can actually potentially cut corners and make savings. And in the Thai situation, the possibility of cutting the corners on labor costs are greater because you have in Thailand a middle class com- country, you know, less than 2% unemployment. Um, surrounded by Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, um, Vietnam, these other neighboring countries that have um, a lot of volatility and fairly extreme poverty. And therefore, huge amounts of young men and boys um, are heading out of those countries into Thailand looking for work. And that makes for a very ripe trafficking situation where a lot of those very desperate individuals end up on the fishing boats and um, often are working either for free or in a debt bonded situation. Um, so in Thailand, the, the investigation was uh, an effort to look at the labor conditions that overlap and intersect with illegal fishing uh, and legal fishing. Uh, and again, I would emphasize you can find these same problems um, in vessels off the coast of Ghana, off the coast of the Falkland Islands. Um, off the coast of New Zealand, you have you know similar problems, but in Thailand, it's especially pervasive. Um, this reporting began in the New York Times and continues presently, um, and really uh, is important in its connection with IUU in the sense that um, you have all sorts of less dramatic um, crimes but equally consequential crimes embedded in the same vessels. So document fraud, bribery, corruption, money laundering, sea slavery and illegal fishing cannot occur without those prerequisite white collar or white paper crimes. And if you talk with folks from Interpol, for example, they're always quick to emphasize that um, until nations take those other crimes seriously and actually put budget toward the investigators and prosecutors and lawyers and academic research that's required to really figure out what to do about those sorts of crimes, tackling the more dramatic crimes such as human trafficking or murder or illegal fishing um, are going to be very difficult because they all rest on these other sorts of crimes. And in the Thai fleet, Uh, especially their distant water vessels, say, near Bangladesh or Somalia, where we looked, um, you see these core white-collar crimes, as well as the challenges of flags of convenience and the ease with which vessels that are involved in bad behavior can change their identity and then sort of walk away from any sort of accumulated bad reputation. Um, These are all prerequisite crimes Um, that need to be focused on um, and we're part of that overall reporting. Um, The the last uh, sort of line of reporting that I'll just touch on briefly, and and ideally all of these um, topics will queue up um, a more lively Q&A session because I can go more deeply into them, um, is a line of reporting that took about a year, year and a half to produce. um, And some members of of the panel uh, were actually involved in the dissemination of of, the, of this reporting, but this was um, a story that you might say began with um, two vexing mysteries. One was the mystery of um, that Japan knows well, which was why are so many North Korean fishing boats washing onto Japanese shores, often with those with dead bodies on board. Um, What is the cause of of those vessels arriving in Japan and why have those numbers steadily been increasing over the last years? And the second um, uh, mystery was why has there been this sharp decline? The numbers, the estimates vary depending on where you are, but um, the, the estimates are that you know, anywhere from 60 and 80 percent, a a very sharp decline in squid stock in the Sea of Japan, um, uh, also called East Sea by some, um, but Sea of Japan, um, uh, why have the the squid stock uh, seen such a sharp decline? Now, um, there there were going um, 
theories and uh, very solid academic research to back those theories as to what drove those things. Um, and the, the big takeaways were um, on the question of the dead bodies washing up and the ghost boats washing up onto Japanese shores, the large um, driver was, you know, possibly worsened by uh, sanctions put on North Korea. But for whatever reason, the food shortage in North Korea, there was growing pressure being placed by the North Korean government on the fishing sector within that country. And so fishermen were being pushed to achieve higher quotas of catch and take more risks, not to mention more untrained individuals, especially from the military, were being put on boats and sent out to sea. These combination of factors meant that fishermen were on a higher, at a higher rate getting stranded at sea. Uh, and more often, um, you know, being overturned by storms, their, you know, dirty fuel and the, the engine breaks down, um, any number of factors occur, those boats get stranded and uh, the individuals freeze to death or drown or starve to death. Um, and the vessel, due to the currents, ends up washing ashore in Japan. Um, not an incorrect theory, uh, probably right, but not the only variable. The other, on the other mystery, why are we seeing this drop of, of the squid stock? Um, again, uh, whether the drop is real, whether it's perceived, whether the migration patterns of the squid are changing due to climate change, all these things are, you know, um, being uh, more rigorously tackled by researchers and academics, many of them in Japan. But the clearly one of the variables. Um, was what we began researching, which was there had long been from Japanese fishermen and from South Korean fishermen um, anecdotal um, reporting about the uh, presence of large numbers of Chinese boats, fishing vessels, squid fishing vessels that were crossing Japanese and, and Korea, South Korean waters and heading into North Korean uh, fishing grounds. This was a a really important and and troubling um, uh, issue, quite especially after 2017, at which point there was a, a set of UN sanctions placed on North Korea in response to nuclear testing. And part of those sanctions explicitly forbade uh, foreign fishing in North Korean waters. That set of sanctions was signed unanimously by the UN Security Council, of which China obviously is a member. And yet, there was anecdotal evidence that large numbers of Chinese vessels were still entering North Korean waters. Whether the North Korean government was aware of it and actually selling those licenses still to the Chinese, or whether they weren't, is somewhat irrelevant, frankly, because in either case, um, it was um, patently illegal vis-a-vis -vis those sanctions. And the challenge from a reporting perspective that we had was to work with the academics, Japanese, South Korean, American, and others, um, who had used a partnership with an organization called Global Fishing Watch to um, leverage satellite information and attempt to essentially put dots on a map and quantify the number of vessels that were entering North Korean waters. Th those Chinese vessels were entering those waters, typically turning off their transponders and going dark, becoming invisible um, uh, to on-land authorities. But through this coalition of academics and Global Fishing Watch, uh, there were alternate ways to lay eyes on the vessels. And it turns out that the numbers were quite shocking um, to the tune of 700 to 900 vessels, Chinese vessels um, in any given year. And that's when we at the Outlaw Ocean Project um, got involved. And the hope journalistically was to put a story behind those dots on the map and also ground truth what the data seemed to be indicating. So we um, uh, took a team to South Korea, um, uh, paid our way onto a South Korean squid fishing vessel, went out to key coordinates where it was most likely going to be the case that we would see, you know, some number of passing Chinese vessels heading toward and ultimately into North Korean waters, and just uh, witness it firsthand. Um, and also film it, you know, uh, so that we could tell a story about this research. And that's just what we did. Uh, we chronicled, uh, we, we stayed there for a while. We're able to eventually lay eyes on a, um, a group of 10 Chinese vessels that were indeed heading into North Korean waters. We followed them for a while, documented 
them, took as much information from what we could by being close to them, put a drone up over them so that we could film them from lots of different angles. And then things became very tense. Um, one of the lead vessels in that convoy split off and, and sort of approached us um, in an aggressive way. And we decided it was probably best that we peel off and um, head back to port. Um, but this was a story that um, I think did a, a bunch of things. One, it showed that IUU often is not an isolated crime. There are ancillary and connected and causally related um, crimes that involve humans, such as these dead bodies washing ashore. The going theory that came out of, the new theory that came out of this research was that while climate change likely is a key factor in the declining squid stock, the presence of 700 to 900 industrial squid vessels is probably also playing an important role. And the presence of those vessels are also, those Chinese vessels in North Korean waters are also likely playing a key role in North Korean fishing boats having to go further from shore to perilous you know, distances and taking greater risks that were culminating more often in these um, uh, deadly incidents of uh, fishermen dying. Um, so this was kind of a textbook in example of what we set out to do journalistically, work with academics, work with um, other types of forums, firms such as Global Fishing Watch and NGOs, use data, but take the data and try to tell stories so that average non-academic uh, consumers of the information would understand it and it would um, compel them to pay attention to these issues. Um, and then also work with um, news outlets around the world, translate the reporting into multiple languages and try to disseminate it more broadly than uh, I had previously done when I was strictly at the New York Times. And, and this was uh, a, a real success, quite frankly, in terms of these ambitions. Um, so th these are just three of the types of stories that um, we've been involved with, um, with that overall set of goals. Again, ultimately trying to report at sea, trying to show the intersectionality of the human and the environmental concerns uh, occurring out there, um, and also trying to um, tell the stories in more creative, broader ways, um, and ultimately highlighting the, the various ways in which um, nearshore national waters or high seas international waters um, suffer, and we all suffer as a result from an overall lack of governance. Uh, so I'll just end there and um, perhaps we can uh, open it up to questions. Thank you, Ian, uh, for very comprehensive uh, talks about uh, I really understood that uh, IUU fishing is very complex and it's just not uh, one thing climb but it's also linked to a range of other climbers and also social issues like poverty and income disparity and you also mentioned this uh, uh, UN Security Council sanctions uh, have uh, also something to do with the illegal fishing uh, in uh, the Sea of Japan. Um, I also understood that uh, to tackle this uh, we have to really have an international coalition it's not just one single country uh, fending off the IUU fishing vessels, but the neighboring countries also have to keep uh, close eyes and make sure that the IUU fishing vessels are not offloading their IUU fishing called uh, seafood uh, in their market. Uh, and, um, you know, we tend to think that the IUU fishing is something that is happening far away from our country, but um, as you mentioned, that uh, it's one of the EU fishing uh, you have observed was actually taking place between China, North Korea, uh, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, so we are also situated very close um, to um, some of the like uh, hot spot or uh, suspicious areas uh, of EU fishing. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, you have uh, done um, uh, the, this reporting for over the years and uh, maybe things may be also changing and you are also getting some reactions from your readers and audience and uh, there are also some policy development afterwards uh, probably thanks to your reporting 
uh, international communities uh, woke up and uh, took the actions to legislate some policy measures. So how do you see the changes uh, that have been taking place over the last few years, in particular uh, in response to your reporting, and also maybe the reactions you are getting from uh, your international audience and the readers of your book uh, regarding your IUU finding? Uh, can you elaborate on these elements? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a tough thing to know for any journalist to honestly figure out um, what is a direct connection to their reporting. Um, at best, you get small glimpses, usually through interactions with different types of stakeholders that come to you and ask for input or guidance. And those are the moments when you think, oh, well, I'm making, I'm having an impact. There are, you know, isolated stories that have very tangible and concrete um, outcomes. So, you know, in the case of the sea slavery reporting, for example, we highlighted, uh, we sort of uh, used as a poster child uh, narrative, the case of a, a Cambodian man named Lang Long, who had been shackled by the neck for um, uh, a long period. He was he was at sea for two years and sold boat to boat. And, and when he wasn't fishing, he was shackled. Um, by putting that story out on the front page of the New York Times and then staying with it for the subsequent four years, the concrete results were those captains were arrested, they've been prosecuted. That individual, you know, was sort of took taken under the wing of the government. Um, and helped um, with funding and mental health services. Um, and there was an overall um, reaction beyond that case from the EU vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with Thailand and its grading system, you know, whether it was a red card, a yellow card, or a green card in terms of imports. There's, those are multi-million dollar consequences for the nation of Thailand. So that one story um, really became a centerpiece in um, uh, uh, for, for the nation of Thailand and its commerce, um, but also for the individual of Lang Long and his life. Um, and similarly, you know, there are other isolated stories. We had a, a murder investigation that began in 2014 that only a month ago, um, you know, this was seven individuals who were killed um, on camera um, by private security um, uh, guards on Taiwanese tuna longliners. And this was all, you know, captured and documented. But um, it took a, you know, a good six years of pressure, journalistic pressure, to get the Taiwanese government to um, arrest, charge, and and um, and two weeks ago convict that captain of those crimes. On IUU issues, it's much murkier. Um, you know, you you see small movement. You you know, it's it's in the form of a phone call from bumblebee tuna, you know, uh, a, an American company um, uh, seeking to have a confidential um, discussion about things that they're trying to do within their supply chain so that they can better ensure that they're not associated with IUU or other crimes. Um, it might be a request from a congressional office to testify on these issues. Uh, it's questions from editors and journalists in other venues that are now wanting to do more stories along these lines. Um, it's regular emails and calls from, you know, organizations or individuals who have read these things and want to change their buying habits. Th th these are the sort of small and large but ongoing um, indications that someone's paying attention. But whether it all adds up um, is hard to hard to say. Thank you, uh, Ian, and um, I really see the connections uh, between the uh, like uh, your reporting and the, maybe the enhanced international uh, awareness and uh, the call for uh, making changes uh, to eliminate uh, your fishings and uh, uh, probably relieve uh, some of those that are trapped in the IU fishing and bring justice uh, to these areas and. Uh, yeah, I really uh, think that uh, uh, you have made a tremendous uh, achievement and contributions to that effect. I uh, should pay a tribute to that. Um, oh, another thing I was wondering was that uh, 
you know, the, the judging from what I have been hearing from you, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, individuals are just doing uh, uh, illegal fishing by themselves, but they are rather trapped in a kind of much broader institutional framework uh, that uh, operating based on some, uh, yeah, uh, economic incentives or, or commercial interests or maybe um, political uh, interests as well. And uh, I just wonder that if you can also touch upon this uh, structural uh, aspect uh, that uh, behind possibly the IUU fishing uh, that you have witnessed. Uh, can I uh, ask you to make comment on that aspect? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if I understand the thinking correctly, the the the, the question is, um, can we get up to an even higher altitude of, of analysis where we think of meta factors that help contribute to the problem of IUU? And at that altitude, I would think, um, number one, you have the sort of nature of globalized um, marketplace, whereby you have, um, you know, seafood that uh, is being caught in one place, packaged in another, um, you know, sort of offloaded in a third and shipped to a fourth. Um, for a long time, the supply chain that a, that a company might use to accomplish that task would be vertical. And they would, the company would, would often own um, the uh, vessels, um, the cold storage where they're cap kept when they come to shore, the processing facilities, the trucks that then transport them, the canneries, um, et cetera. That day has long since passed due to globalization, and now most supply chains, and quite especially seafood, is rarely owned in a vertical fashion, which may be by design. You know, it's certainly uh, more price efficient for um, companies to outsource that to other specialized partners. It also makes, though, the ability for governments or academics to actually track those supply chains so much harder because there are all these different players involved. And that fractured nature of seafood supply chains um, is one of the biggest challenges that um, I think um, has emerged in the last two decades. I think um, switching entirely to other drivers of, of IUU you know, you do have um, geopolitical um, uh, factors uh, involved in some places. So, for example, um, if you look at the Chinese fleet in particular, to some degree, um, uh, it is engaged in fishing, right? You know, fishing vessels are fishing, and that's what they are meant to do. And and they're, they're not nefarious, nor is the Chinese government nefarious. Um, they are motivated by uh, self-interest in much the same way that the U.S. government as an imperial power has been for decades. So I don't mean to pass some sort of racist judgment about um, the distinct movement here, but the, the Chinese government is um, attempting to, to, on the one hand, um, establish more control over certain protein sources for its rapidly growing population and rely less on others and more on itself so that it can produce enough food to feed its own population as that population grows. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it is one of the drivers in the subsidized and bloated nature of its um, fishing fleet. Um, the, the other driver though is the use of fishing vessels as geopolitical pawns in, that are actually doing other things. So if you look at the South China Sea and you look at um, the number of fishing vessels in certain places there, and then you actually look at the research of academics who've watched to see if those fishing vessels engage in fishing, and it turns out they don't, then you have to ask, what are they doing there? And what they're doing is creating certain facts on the ground, if you will. They're establishing precedent. They're establishing occupation We so that in years to come, they can say, we have been for centuries, for decades, and for years recently, a robust presence in those waters, and therefore we should have um, rights to um, the access to the subsoil mineral wealth, oil and gas, or the throughway 
rights of commercial vessels that want to pass in those regions, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are geopolitical plays where um, fishing vessels are not actually, at, at, you know, sort of achieving to get food and protein tourists, but rather they're doing other other types of work. And that's, a, I think, a, a, a meta structural factor involved in some of the IUU activity that you see. Thank you, Ian. Um, um, I see this uh, complex uh, issue again, the supply chains and also geopolitical issues and also commercial uh, interests. And then uh, not just to fisheries, but also like uh, mineral resources or oil and gas uh, in the seabed areas. Um, so so I, I thank you for putting up that kind of uh, spectrum of all the issues interlinked uh, with IUU fishing. And then maybe the last questions uh, uh, from me before we uh, move on to the panel discussion will be about this uh, supply chain. When you discuss it, this aquaculture is also quite important. And when we look at this uh, Asia, uh, Pacific and Indian Ocean and maybe Africa, they are also closely interlinked vis-a-vis uh, -vis this um, uh, seafood supply chain, including aquaculture products. Did you witness anything about uh, issues related to aquaculture or, uh, you know, the discussing the sustainability in fishery and aquacultures, uh, possibly Asia, Pacific, Indian Ocean and uh, Eastern African coast? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the story of aquaculture is a fascinating one because at, at its core, or at least the part of the story that really interests me quite recently is um, the part of the story that is um, best intentions, worse, worse consequences, sort of. Um, and it, it by that I mean, um, for a long time, aquaculture, and to some degree still, aquaculture was seen as a method for slowing ocean depletion, for controlling the rate at which the world's seas were running out of fish, wild caught fish. Um, and the thought here on a simplistic level was if we can raise fish on our own in a farmed sort of capacity, near shore or in onshore pens, then we will have to catch fewer of them from the wild. And that will give the wild a chance to replenish. And it's, there's some logic to it, but then th the problems emerge. The well-known problems with aquaculture are um, when you, the same problems that emerged when you began doing industrial scale, um, uh, you know, livestock penning. You know, you put lots of chickens or pigs or cows in, in a gigantic pen, you have difficulties. Number one, keeping them healthy. Um, and so you have to start relying more on antibiotics because they're too close together in an unhealthy capacity. You have um, the emissions and runoff problems of their waste, um, that becomes a major concern. Um, and you also have the sort of market pressures to fatten them up faster, right? So industry begins feeding them things to get them to come to market sooner. Okay, take the, the, the cow and the pig and the chicken story and now move it onto the water and you have the same problems. You have a waste problem with aquaculture. You have a feeding problem with aquaculture. You have a fattening up um, problem with aquaculture, um, and you have an antibiotics problem, right? And, and uh, among other problems. And so the 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 problem that interested me with aquaculture was this feeding problem, especially since what has emerged in the aquaculture market is um, a sort of high protein pelletized source of fattening up of the fish it used to be soy based. And in the last decade has moved largely over to fish meal, which as you know, um, is wild caught fish ground up into high protein powder or pellets that are then fill, fed to farmed fish, which makes no sense, right? If you think of the original motivation was to slow down the capture of wild caught, but you're now catching wild caught fish to feed them to farmed fish, you've got a really problematic cycle. And, and that is the irony of, of uh, one of the ironies of aquaculture. And how this plays out globally is 
Um, you have places like Gambia in, in, in West Africa, which is where I spent a fair amount of time on patrols looking at this issue. And again, not to demonize the Chinese, but they are the biggest player out there on the seas. And so often you run into them. And in Gambia, the major players of industrial foreign fishing on those waters are Chinese and Taiwanese and some South Korean. Those vessels are largely catching forage fish, which is fish that typically is smaller than is marketable um, for human consumption. And when they're catching this fish in large, large quantities, grinding them up and pelletizing them into fish meal that they then ship back to China and export either they feed to aquaculture in China or they're exporting to Norway and the US and EU and other places for aquaculture in those places. And the consequence for Gambians is severe because for ages, there's a fish called bonga fish, B-O-N-G-A, which was so plentiful in Gambian waters. And it was such a staple that when you went to the, the market in Gambia, you could get ga bonga for free. You know, it was it was something you got on the side of other things you might purchase because it was so cheap. And now bonga are being captured, ground up and made into fish meal. And local Gambians can't, buy, can't afford bonga because the price of it is so high because it's all going into fish meal factories. And what that's doing is destabilizing the food security of a developing nation, namely Gambia, where now you have Gambians are largely getting their protein from imported chicken. Where? From China. So you have this crazy cycle in which you have Gambians buying chicken that's shipped to Gambia rather than eating bonga, which is in their own waters, because that's getting ground up and exported back to China. And this is just an example of one of the dark ironies of the global seafood market. Thank you. I, I really see this uh, complexity again about these fisheries and the fish meal for uh, aquaculture and also like a chicken import export uh, between the uh, across the continent. And um, I thank you uh, for highlighting that aspect as well. And uh, yeah, I, I, I rather love to continue, but at the same time, um, I also like to listen to other Japanese experts uh, and uh, see what would be their reactions to your talks. And uh, may I just invite uh, three Japanese colleagues to turn on your cameras and the uh, first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Mr. Tetsuji Ida. He's a very uh, distinguished and a leading journalist of the Kyodo News Agency based in Japan. And he has uh, extensive coverage of environment and the sustainability issues, including eel and uh, seafood and the fishery as well. Um, so may I uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Ida uh, just to tell us how did you see the significance of Ian's reporting and uh, he also spoke about uh, this uh, illegal fishing taking place in the Sea of Japan um, between the four countries in Northeast Asia. Um, I, yeah, can, can I invite uh, Mr. Ida um, and to present your views on the issue that Ian just uh, presented? Mr. Ida, please. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me, and this is my great honor to be one of the members of the panelists, panelists of great of this great discussion. I once worked with Ian. The I made a news story is based on his activities of his research uh, done by that together with Global Fishing Watch. That the stories on the Chinese. Our uh, fishing boat activity, IUU activities in the North Korean waters. And the most inter interesting things for me was he showed me a connection that just, just he told me before, he told us before that the con he showed me a connection between the uh, IUU activities and um, so many uh, North Korean boat, small boat, and end up ending up with Japanese coast and some in this, we found some so many uh, dead bodies of uh, poor fishermen from North Korea that that we it's that kind of connection is very interesting and very important for me I think I've been I've been reporting 
uh, environment issue for more than 30 years and also I visited many places and I also always find that the environment destruction come together with human rights violation and their forest destruction and far more or lava plantation, also there are activities like that Ian showed us. So there, we needed to see that fact, not only we needed to focus on not, not only for the environment destruction, we need, we don't, we should not forget the other aspect that the severe uh, human rights violation come together with that. And we also, we needed, we don't forget that forest people is will be a fast victim of environment destruction, like the poor North Korean fishermen end up with Japanese coast in the hit. And that that uh, his one of the important activities done by Ian. And also I know that I I, I made some report on IU activities and like uh, in many countries, but the uh, I would say that in the, what's happening on the sea is very invisible and as a journalist it's very hard to make visible and the interested, interesting thing for me is there are, as a global fishing watch and more sophisticated IT technology and satellite technologies contribute to make it visible. I think there are for the to make visible what's happening in the high seas or a lot, a lot on the environment destruction and the sea and the human rights violation the, we needed to have sophisticated technology like global fishing watch and we and we needed to have the uh, eminent journalists like Ian and also they should NGO should be involved and more and more researchers should be involved and to make these things uh, much much more visible to the public. Now that our first comment and impression I got uh, today's talk from Ian. Thank you very much Mr. Ida and I was highlighting this uh, linkages between IU fishing and the poverty and also um, I think um, Ian also articulated that it's not so easy uh, to report on what is happening in the oceans. It's far away and uh, very invisible in, to some extent um, and uh, yeah we, you can we can use uh, satellite data etc but I think uh, Ian has been trying to create a kind of human stories about uh, people who are trapped in the IU fishing or uh, operating uh, in the IU fishing sectors. Um, so that probably make it more costly or expensive for your <laughs> operation as well as to cover uh, the, the, what is happening on the oceans. Any reactions from Ian to the comment made by Mr. Ida? No, I mean, um, look, Mr. Ida and I knew each other prior to this panel because we worked together on that very story. <laughs> and in some ways, um, it, it, it's one of the best things about the story in, in the sense that it shows, um, number one, that um, the internet has allowed collaborations, efficient collaborations like this one that um, previously were tough to do. Um, and now um, if there's trust and, and communication, um, you know, you can take a story that we produced in the U.S. and work with Kyoto News, um, and we have worked with them subsequently. Um, so I think that's key. I think the other thing that's key is, um, again, as a former academic myself, I do think that there um, isn't often enough collaboration between academics and journalists, and it's a scary thing for both sides um, because they come from different um professions you know and they have their own timetables and language and all these sorts of things but if you can find um and really work towards overlapping like was the case here where the academic publication was in a peer-reviewed journal it took a lot of work and a lot of waiting for that vetting to occur which is appropriate to the academic realm they had faith in our side to abide by the embargo and not push our story out until they had their work done, um, but but they also 
knew that we were going to um, do our own independent reporting and have different sets of priorities. And that I think is essential and should happen more often. And again, the international nature of the academics themselves, the Japanese, South Korean, Russian, American, you know, all these folks working together uh, on a shared goal. So there, there, there were a lot of things that were really amazing about that reporting um, that I hope we can re replicate. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with Ian that more independent researchers should be involved in this kind of project to, to make things much more, much, much more visible. And also it can make the things much more reliable. Thank you. Uh, thank you for touching on this uh, importance of collaborating, um, uh, collaboration between academia and the journalists. Yes. Uh, I think that this is very important and also an important message to us as well. Uh, and so uh, the just, uh, NGOs should be involved. Yeah, and the NGOs, yes. And so let me just uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Ms. Yoko Tamura and the representatives of the Global Marine Consulting based in Ishigaki, Okinawa, Japan. She's quite familiar with, for instance, uh, Marine Stewardship Council uh, certifications uh, and the sustainability fisheries. Um, so looking at uh, this IUU issues from this uh, uh, ensuring a sustainability in the fisheries, may I invite uh, uh, Tamura-san to tell us your views and the reactions to Ian's uh, talks. Uh, Tamura-san, please. Thank you for introduction and thank you, Ian, for revealing such a striking stories from the most front line of the news and making it available to the public. So um, I'm an independent fisheries consultant um, for sustainable fisheries. And I've been working on MSC fisheries assessment for the past seven years. So um, I'd like to make a comment, uh, actually two comments on the perspectives of the fisheries and the IUU. So firstly, um, I'd like to comment that the, um, because of the increased reports like yours, um, there has been more awareness on the IUU fisheries recently compared to the past. So um, the MSC actually made a new requirement from the 2019 that the every fishery certified should declare its policy for um, forced labor and child labor, and it will be posted online and available to public on the MSC website. And throughout the traceability chain also, the third party auditor will check that every seller and buyer who's dealing with a product will be um, free from the IEU fisheries or consistent with the policy. So at least the consumer uh, can be ensured that the products are screened from screened for the um, IUU fishery. And it's a small step, I know, but um, at least it's making a progress. And the second point that I want to make is that the um, MSC assessment actually requires that the assessment covers the whole stock level. So not only the management in one area, but the uh, if the fish moves out of the jurisdiction, then we have to check the other management if that is really sustainable so that the entire stock sustainability will be ensured. Um, and this presents an important challenge for Japan because many important commercial um, species for Japan are widely distributed species and now they are more and more caught by the other nations like China and Korea um, who's catching just outside of the EEC. And actually there is an um, uh, international body of the management uh, to cover that. And as you know, the NPFC, the North Pacific Fisheries Commission is tasked to manage those regionally distributed uh, fisheries space, uh, fisheries stock in the North Pacific. And all or uh, most of the major 
commercial fishing nations are already the member of the com uh, commission, like the Japan, Korea, China, and Russia, America. Um, so it is really the effectiveness of this NPFC that is a question. Um, so take, taking an example of the squid, uh, in Japan, there is um, this annual stock assessment for squid, but it doesn't consider the catch of the IUU. So there is some um, uncertainty, big uncertainty um, for the stock status. So I believe that the strengthening of the function and management of the NPFC um, is one of the important aspects um, in dealing with the IUU fisheries in Japan. And also it has a big stake uh, for Japan to gain any MSC certification for the, those um, commercial species uh, distributing widely. Thank, thank you. Um, I think uh, you have really addressed a very important point uh, of that uh, the MSC is uh, certainly one instrument to eliminate uh, IUU fishing or at least uh, inform the consumers of the sources of the seafood. But it also depends on the market conditions, maybe the areas where Ian uh, is there, uh, you may uh, see more product with uh, MSC, MSC certified products or even Europe, but in Japan, it may be slightly limited. So the penetration of MSC in the market uh, differ from a region to the regions. Uh, the other point, I think she also mentioned a very important part, this uh, regional um, uh, fishery management organizations uh, for the Pacific, uh, North Pacific uh, Fishery Commission. Uh, is tasked to manage the seafood and fishery stocks uh, in the region. So nonetheless, this squid uh, is not necessarily covered by the effective policies or management tools yet. Uh, so um, we, we see this uh, kind of policy gaps there. And uh, I just wonder if Ian can comment on this uh, MSC and uh, regional fishery management organizations um, task and responsibility. No, I, I think um, you made really good points. Um, you know, it's it's often um, if you think of a metaphor that moves us out of the fisheries language and into the language that everyone else uses. Imagine you're in um, a country where the police are only supposed to um, be watching for illegalities from blue trucks, not all trucks and not any color truck and not sedans or other vehicles, but just blue trucks. I mean, that would make no sense. Um, you, know, you would want to give the police the jurisdiction and the responsibility to cover all vehicles, trucks, cars, you know, but instead regional fisheries management organizations often have very slivers of what they are allowed and responsible to do. And number one, you have the problem of there are all sorts of types, as you rightly point out, types of, of the very creature they're supposed to be watching over that don't fit. And then number two, the creatures are moving across their jurisdiction oftentimes, and so they can enter or leave. And, and this is the core, one of many core challenges, I think, that you pointed out. Um, with RFMOs. Um, and, and then, you know, whether it's MSC, so, you know, certification regimes or RFMOs, um, th there, are, there are also the categories of challenges that exist on the water. So transshipment, right? You know, even if you had the best police force mechanism there and they had full jurisdiction and they were funded and all these things, you then have the problem of, you um, keeping track of what those players on the water are actually doing is distinctly difficult because they may be moving their cargo over. They could be throwing bycatch overboard and, and bringing new catch. And so even the best MSC or RFMO has a difficult job. So I just would amplify the points that you made. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I think uh, there's a kind of merit in really looking into this uh, 
uh, further improvement uh, or development of RFMOs and uh, their uh, operations in the regions. And uh, yes, this fish stocks moves around. If uh, it goes over the jurisdiction areas, then there may be another loophole as well. So this is maybe the area that the journalists, practitioners and uh, researchers can work together to see how we can really improve and the mechanisms under which the different type of the RFMOs and the certification schemes uh, can actually perform to eliminate IUU fishing and uh, promote the fishery sustainability. Uh, any remarks from Tamara-san and uh, just to add uh, to supplement to your comment? Um, I, well, thank you so much for your comment. Um, yes, that's really true that, you know, like, you know, currently, like outside of EEZ, um, we are not considering any catch in a, um, in a stock assessment in Japan. So, you know, that's really a problem. And, and also, like, you know, you work with Global Fishing Watch a lot and, and uh, government is actually also, you know, I think they are partially working with the Global Fishing Watch, so they do have the data. They are just not so, you know, like open um, and explicit that, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're working with them and they can use the data and then, you know, they want to be more um, preservative to have, you know, to make sure that, you know, they're okay to use the data with more pre you know precise way so um that kind of things also slows down so um yeah but the tools are increasing so that's really good yeah so the collaboration with ngos and the application of satellite data uh, for instance by the one uh, by the global fishing watch uh, maybe also the opening up a kind of further uh, ways uh, to address this IUU fishing and uh, seafood sustainability. Um, so let me um, turn to uh, next uh, panelist, uh, Professor Chisako Masuo of the Kyushu University. Uh, she has uh, special uh, special specializations in the uh, uh, Northeast Asia and the China policy, in particular. Um, um, China, um, I think it was also reported that uh, the, the new legislations came into, into effect uh, early this month uh, to allow the Chinese uh, Coast Guards to um, exercise uh, um, the, the, uh, as, as, as further duties and to uh, monitor the uh, ocean as well. And uh, people are anxious uh, what would be the implications uh, of that legislations, and uh, as um, uh, it was highlighted a number of times uh, today, that the China um, plays a very important role in eliminating IUU fishing and promoting uh, sustainable fisheries, and uh, maybe making sure that uh, sustainable development, uh, including the human rights uh, protections and uh, poverty eradications. Uh, marine uh, resource and uh, environment conservations uh, will be also achieved. Uh, um, uh, so may I uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Masuo uh, tell us uh, your views uh, in response to the Ian's uh, comments and the talks, uh, in particular uh, in the light of the uh, recent policy development uh, by the countries such as uh, China. So Professor Masuo, uh, please take a floor. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, I really enjoyed your uh, very interesting, uh, very uh, intense stories about IUU. Uh, I myself is not a specialist on this issue, and I learned a lot uh, from you. Um, I myself uh, has been uh, studying Chinese foreign policy uh, for many years, and then uh, recently I'm a little bit uh, interested in uh, Chinese uh, fishing policy. Um, so from this perspective, I would like to make my comment. Uh, listening to uh, Ian's story, I uh, hit an idea that there might be two types of IUU fishing. 
Uh, one is uh, the one uh, uh, made by uh, uncontrolled vessels. Uh, you know, there are, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, there are many uh, governments, governments that do not have uh, capability to control uh, its own uh, their, uh, their own waters. Uh, and there are uh, many people who uh, have uh, who are motivated uh, to go for IUU fishing for their own uh, economic interests. So uh, probably that's the traditional type of IUU fishing. However, uh, probably there is another type of IUU fishing uh, carried uh, uh, made by uh, controlled fishing vessels. Um, I uh, say this, uh, I point uh, this out because I think uh, there is a possibility that uh, Chinese authority uh, intentionally uh, <laughs> operate uh, this uh, type of fishing. Uh, so uh, to, uh, today's uh, in, within uh, your uh, talk, uh, probably Palau and uh, Thai case uh, fits into this un un uh, the first type, and maybe uh, the Japan Sea uh, falls onto the second type. Um, if I can introduce the uh, case of. Chinese fishing policy. Uh, China has been uh, putting a lot of emphasis on uh, sus uh, sustainability of its uh, fishing operation recently, especially after uh, 2016, uh, when uh, the final ruling of uh, PCA, uh, the Permanent Code of Arbitration, uh, was given uh, and uh, the claim was made by Philippine as all know, as we all know and then uh, the uh, ruling uh, criticized uh, China's reclamation in the South China Sea and then it also criticized uh, China's uh, China uh, saying that uh, China was making a you know a huge harms to the environmental uh, situations in the South China Sea. So uh, the next year, uh, in 2017, uh, China actually uh, initiated a new uh, fishing reform. Uh, you know, in earlier days, uh, China didn't uh, control its fishing vessels seriously. However, it totally shifted uh, its attitudes toward the fishing vessels. And then it started to um, reduce uh, the number of uh, fishing vessels and also its uh, their powers and they also uh, started to cut off uh, the uh, the fish catch for about uh, uh, for about 30 percent so that they can reduce the uh, the pressure uh, on the sea uh, res uh, the fishing resources in their uh, so-called jurisdiction water uh, that includes uh, basically the water within the first island chain um, and then I started to control its uh, ports. Uh, in earlier days, uh, all the uh, Chinese fishing vessels could enter into uh, any ports and then uh, uh, unload their fishing uh, ca uh, fish catch uh, so that they can, you know, maximize. Uh, they can choose uh, the ports to unload the, the fish and the, where they can, you know, uh, uh, which market they want to sell so to, to increase their gains however uh, after that uh, they had to uh, they can only uh, apply their fishing uh, licenses uh, and they could uh, uh, to uh, have uh, their own you know mother uh, they, uh, to have only one mother ports and once they uh, go into the ports, uh, they're strictly controlled by the local authorities. And then also uh, the Beidou satellite system was enhanced. Uh, China started to uh, install uh, the uh, uh, China started to uh, use uh, Beidou satellite system to control. Uh, its fishing vessels starting from uh, 2006. Uh, the, they called the 
uh, the system, uh, VMS, uh, vessel monitoring system, but Chinese VMS uh, only operates on the um, uh, Beitou satellite system. I think uh, they used to operate, uh, they could operate using the uh, using GMS, but now nowadays they only use Beitou. And then uh, this had been uh, developed very well. Uh, it's a perfect system. Uh, through this, uh, through Chinese VMS, uh, Chinese fishermen can contact the authorities anytime. And of course, the authorities can contact the fishing vessels anytime. And of course, uh, the licensed uh, vessels cannot turn off uh, the Beitou satellite system. So unlike uh, the fishing vessels turning off the uh, GMS or AIS signals uh, when they enter Japan Sea, uh, Chinese uh, authority can cont can uh, see where those vessels, where those Chinese vessels are anytime. And uh, uh, last year, in two th uh, last November, um, Chinese uh, authority has publicized a uh, white paper, uh, promise white paper, they call it, uh, on the offshore fishing. Uh, uh, when they talk about offshore fishing, uh, it's about the Chinese fishing operation outside their jurisdiction water. So uh, the Pacific, if, if those vessels are in the Pacific Ocean uh, or if they're operating in the Arctic Ocean, uh, you know, it is all included in the off uh, in this white paper. But uh, we, uh, according to, to this white paper, the Chinese authority is controlling the fishing operation, uh, the fishing operation, offshore fishing operation of Chinese vessels for 100 percent. Uh, so I would like to uh, 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 invite Ian, uh, uh, what you think of this, uh, <laughs> my uh, certain idea <laughs> that I uh, hit upon uh, listening to your uh, stories. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Professor Masuo, and uh, she highlighted this uh, uh, globalizing nature of the Chinese fishery operations and also the availability of uh, high tech uh, uh, in the uh, Chinese authorities and also fishing vessels. And um, maybe um, there's a question of this uh, political will about how they can actually reinforce this elimination of IUU fishing. Um, so I just wondered if Ian has any reactions to the comments made by Professor Masu. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think. Um the, the thing that caught my attention most um, about those insightful substantive comments are um, this point and for the lay audience about AIS versus VMS, you know, two main methods that um, various players use to keep track of where ships are. And as was said, VMS is the method that um, is harder to turn off um, and, and it's hardwired on the ship. Um, but it's also more private and only the government players can see that data unless the government like Indonesia, you know, decides to share it. Um, if it is indeed the case, which I don't doubt based on what the professor said, that China um, has, uh, you know, 100 percent, uh, that seems to me doubtful, but, you know, a really high percent of its vessels are BMS wired. And indeed, the VMS data they're getting is global. Um, then that changes the playing field um, on the politics of their historical response about many things. One is um, if you look at the UN body that monitors the sanctions um, on the Sea of Japan, um, there have been year in, year out, anonymously provided, most likely by the Japanese government and the South Korean government, complaints about. Um, these Chinese vessels entering North Korean waters. And they're right there in writing, you know, documented reports um, asking the UN body to do something about it. Thank you, uh, Ian. Um, um, can I proceed? Do, 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 does uh, Professor Masos has anything to add to respond? 
Oh, uh, China has been very proud. I mean, uh, Xi, Jinping, uh, ha, uh, Xi Jinping government has been very proud of their achievement uh, to have uh, improved uh, fishing control, uh, fishing vessel controls. And uh, last year, I saw many uh, news uh, released by Chinese local authorities to demolish the unlicensed vessels. Uh, so uh, previously, uh, they were missioned to uh, have you know complete control over their local vessels. Uh, so uh, they have to catch uh, the illegal, uh, the unlike no license uh, vessels. So they did that to demolish uh, those uh, catched vessels uh, all over China. Um, so uh, I think uh, for and uh, nowadays uh, many uh, unlicensed fishing vessels cannot come back to China because ports are already uh, uh, digit digitally controlled by the authority. So uh, there is, uh, I think uh, there are, there could be cases uh, where um, Chinese vessels uh, could not go back to China, so they had to uh, be so, uh, maybe sold to foreign uh, partners or they had to move their mother ports so that they can keep operation there, uh, but they are, uh, their base, uh, that their, their uh, operation base cannot uh, come back to China, but maybe the, the local company can still make some money. So in that case, uh, those vessels may not uh, belong to the Chinese control uh, anymore. Thank you. Um, I now have a pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Charlotte Noswosi, Director at Arturo Ocean LLC. Um, thank you for being with us and uh, can you tell us um, your plan and aspirations to advance your project out of the ocean and shed a light on IUU fishing and, and you know the, the enhanced awareness and uh, international um, actions to eliminate IUU fishing. Thank you for that question. So we actually have a lot of exciting upcoming projects for the Outlaw Ocean Project. We are really prioritizing in 2021, reaching a global and diverse audience. One way that we've been doing that is through a relatively new project called the Outlaw Ocean Music Project, which is a project that joins together more than 400 artists from more than 80 countries all over the world. And they produce music in a range of genres, ranging from uh, hip hop to instrumental to um, electronic. And we collaborate with them. We extend all of our reporting material all of the materials that Ian collected over the course of five years of reporting at sea. Lots of really gritty and fantastic audio pieces that these artists will incorporate into their own music and that enables them to reach their own personal audience. So in doing so by partnering with all of these musicians we are uh, expanding our reach for the Outlaw Ocean Project and that includes Japan. Um, and so our priority going into 2021 is to continue expanding that reach, uh, prioritizing places like the Global South, and um, continuing to spread awareness about these issues of lawlessness at sea. Um, we're also continuing to report on investigative stories. We have our most recent um, investigation is going to be coming out in just a couple of weeks with the New Yorker, and we will continue uh, reporting on that recent story, which is going to be based in the Gambia. So we have a lot of uh, really great projects in store for 2021. Obviously with COVID and with the pandemic, uh, we've been stunted a little bit in terms of the progress that we've wanted to make, but we've been really excited with the progress that we've been able to make in 2020 and continue to build upon that momentum going into the new year. So uh, really exciting stuff and um, something that we will continue to prioritize is reaching a global audience, trying to spread awareness of the these issues in a diverse and innovative fashion. So that is the sort of projects that I oversee at Synesthesia Media and at the Outlaw Ocean Project is our sort of innovative strategies and um, continuing to think about ways that we can reach people uh, in the way that they want to be reached. That includes publishing our content in uh, dozens of countries and dozens of languages, uh, languages including that of music. So um, we're very excited to continue to think about journalism and specifically these ocean issues in an innovative way. 
And uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, we are already running uh, out of time or we are going over the uh, agreed time. And uh, yeah, I have a, f a few questions I have received and I wanted to flag them uh, before I solicit your final remarks uh, to conclude this. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, the support state measures agreement uh, adopted by at the FAO conference uh, is a one of the central um, uh, inter institutional uh, policy uh, centerpiece um, for eliminating IU fishing. And nonetheless, uh, major countries haven't yet uh, been a parties uh, to this uh, port state measures agreement. So this uh, institution, international policy uh, framework hasn't yet been uh, honored uh, in order to eliminate IU fishing. So how can we really accelerate the universal uh, ratification and accessions to the IU uh, port state measures agreement? This is a, one question. The second is uh, this uh, subsidy issues. I think Ian mentioned this uh, subsidies uh, are also playing a role in um, you know tolerating uh, this uh, IUU fishing and the WTO World Trade Organizations uh, has uh, uh, long lasting negotiations but coming close to the uh, final agreement uh, that people are expecting and um, so um, for subsidy issues how can we really make sure that uh, uh, phasing out of all the subsidies that can contribute to are you fishing or overfishing? Uh, this is the second uh, question. And the last point is uh, transparency. I think uh, information disclosure, information sharing is uh, also important and the uh, stakeholder involvement. And I think uh, Ian uh, highlighted a number of times this collaboration between uh, journalists, academias, and practitioner NGOs. Uh, they probably help enhancing transparency and also uh, like uh, stakeholders' involvement in eliminating IU fishings. So these are the kind of questions that I have received, and I wonder if uh, each one of you can try to make uh, last remarks, uh, hopefully in one minute, uh, just to uh, uh, conclude our discussion. So may I start with Ian? Um, maybe I, I will come back to you after listening to three other colleagues, but. Uh, uh, can I invite uh, Ian to uh, say um, s uh, s some words uh, on these elements? Sure. Um, three topics, 60 seconds to cover them, so 20 seconds per topic. Um, <laughs> so port state measure agreement. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it doesn't work unless you get a threshold of countries to cooperate. Um, and um, that usually comes by incentivizing um, you know the poor nations to join, and and that's really you know diplomacy and and aid deals and these sorts of things. I think this new administration in the U.S. Uh, has more of a mentality that sees the logic in doing that. So I imagine there'll be um, upticking of signatories. Um, transparency, um, yeah. I mean, I think you look at VMS data as a perfect example. If tomorrow all that data was made um, transparent, suddenly you would have massive shift in these problems because now we would have definitive proof of how many vessels, where they're going. There are lots of ways to game even VMS. You register one vessel, but you've got nine under the same name. You know, But still, it would be a big boon. Um, I do think there needs to be more countries that, including Japan perhaps, that sh publicly um, shares uh, the data with the public, with journalists, with NGOs like Global Fishing Watch. And then the third point was um, uh, port state control. Remind me, Masanori. And uh, subsidies. And subsidies, yeah, yeah, my favorite. Yeah, I mean, I think subsidies is a perfect example of, uh, um, it's easy from an ocean conservation point of view to bang on subsidies, but if you try to have a more holistic view and think about developing nations and vulnerable populations and such, um, you start to understand a little bit more why places like India are very resistant to um, get on board because there are very vulnerable you know, sectors of society that depend on their subsidies. At the end of the day, though, unless, unless you know, the global community tackles subsidies and begins to discern between good and bad subsidies and leans on countries like Japan, like South Korea, like Norway, like Spain, like China, you know, um, to, and like the U.S., to really pull away from subsidizing the bloated fleets, um, you're not going to be able to control the pace of overfishing. Uh, so I do think subsidies is a really valuable topic. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Ida-san? Um, 
Uh, please unmute uh, yourself. Sorry, I got me. So the, very briefly, we needed to pressure. We needed to make pressure in the society and internationally to make some kind of incentives for the international for the government. Uh, the government do something about IUU, and also we needed to work in domestically to make our for uh, policy makers more active for this issue. That is needed. Press needed to make some social pressure. That is why I said that the energy activity is very important. So the, by doing so, to do so that we needed more uh, information and we needed to make pressure on the buyers, the sellers, as a as a daily consumers. And it sounds very much long, very much long, long way. But we needed to make some pre social pressure and in many aspects of the society. I think that is one of the reasons uh one of the answer uh for your question for all three questions and that as for the transparency i won't uh raise one issue that the trans shipment on the ocean that's that things make the more things much much more complicated and much things much much more invisible i know that global fishing watch now working on the trans shipment on the ocean to monitor using satellite data. We should uh, put some focus on the trans shipment activities on the ocean for the, to make it, the uh, fishing activities more transparent. That's a comment from me. Thank you, uh, Ida-san. And um, Tamara-san, please. Thank you. Um, so I think Ian and Ida-san already covered most of the things that um, I wanted to mention, but um, I, well, I was talking from the MSC assessment perspective, but, you know, like it's it's really, you know, um, the currently the 70% of the global seafood production in ocean is covered by MSC certification, but IUU is also like 15% of the global um, seafood production. So, you know, even if I do like assessment like one by one, it's really one drop in the ocean, like in a vast ocean. And it's really, you know, it's a chicken race to, you know, to close the loopholes. Like, but um, yeah, but as we are, you know, talking like we are now having more increased measures from like different perspectives. So, um, and, you know, talking about the transparency, I think really it's the key. Um, and I do think the the key is like really the digital, like digitalizing um, and transforming all this, you know, like, um, like, degree of the openness so you know like right now even if we have some post-date measures like the documents are paper-based and it's so ineffective to actually see the all the chain of the problems so once we have more digitalized system to analyze in effective way then i think it will change you know you know with more you know better speed so can I invite uh, Professor uh, Tisa Komasu to uh, give us your comment uh, on these elements? Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the chance to make the final comment. Uh, I think um, uh, C is the, is the global commons, and but uh, it's very hard to have a um, good governance over the C under the current international situations. There are so many uh, uh, sovereign countries and uh, in uh, different development degrees. So uh, it's, it is very important for us to uh, ha uh, develop uh, a new uh, governance a global governance system over the sea, uh, which uh, everybody can be happy about. Um, uh, China always had um, their uh, when uh, Chinese people think about uh, the maritime uh, issues, they uh, tend to hit upon uh, the victimhood 
perceptions. <laughs> uh, they always have it because uh, they have the uh, very bitter memory on their own history uh, invaded mainly by uh, the sea front. Uh, however, um, you know, uh, they, uh, today we have talked about China a lot, but uh, they tend to uh, request closed uh, governance system uh, controlled by its uh, uh, by its own authority, and uh, uh, I know uh, that the uh, the Chinese government is trying to encourage many developing countries to use uh, the Beidou satellite system and also uh, Chinese VMS system uh, so that uh, many uh, people in the developing uh, they say uh, that the many people in the developing countries. Uh, can make use of it. Uh, Chinese VMS is a very good system. Uh, they can communicate with the, uh, their uh, their families uh, every time, uh, all the time uh, when they're uh, in the fishing operation. Uh, so and they can also uh, make uh, satellite telephones uh, in a very cheap uh, price, like one uh, or two cents a minute. Uh, so it's a very attractive system they're developing. However, uh, it's a very closed system. You know, uh, if they encourage many uh, fishermen in the developing countries to use that system, they can, you know, gather uh, information, uh, global information on the maritime domain, and they can uh, uh, improve the accuracy of their satellite system. And if any security case happens, they can make use of it. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, in a very uh, sensitive uh, role, a sensitive junction, uh, which what kind of uh, international system we are trying to develop in the future. And we really need to think of it uh, very seriously at this moment. Thank you. I, I, I do think it's, it's legitimate because China is a big player, the biggest. But I think at the same time, we should, you know, you looked at transparency, you looked at um, um, court state control. These are largely government um, type of fixes and um, market the companies be they Japanese, be they South Korean, be they American, um, are bringing a lot of this fish to shore and selling it in hotels and schools and restaurants. And so we are all um, very much, all of our countries are very much involved in the supply chain. Um, and so I, I think that really thinking about number one, the leverage that the market and corporate players can play. Um, I think also shining a really harsh light on the companies that are benefiting from these problematic behaviors, not just the governments and not just foreign governments, but our own governments are also two things that we should be very mindful of in, in these discussions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Totally uh, so may I intervene that I totally yeah. agree with Ian. We need to make some put pressure on buyers, sellers in, in your country to do more, to be more transparent, to be more uh, human rights conscious and environment conscious that we need to make, put pressure on buyers, sellers in no countries. Thank you. And I now would like to invite uh, Charlotte to make uh, any message to the Japanese audience in particular, um, based on the discussion that we had uh, for today. To the Japanese audience, I would just encourage you to get inspired, get engaged, read, learn about what's happening in your nation's waters and in surrounding countries' waters, how that activity may be impacting the world's oceans. We're all connected. Um, all of our supply chains travel by way of sea. And I would just encourage you to find organizations that inspire you, that can fuel you with knowledge to be a more informed consumer, a more informed uh, participant, and, and to refrain from being complacent in these issues. Whether we realize it or not, our habits are 
feeding into a lot of the illegal activity that we've talked about today. And I think if you want to see a change, you can start with your own habits and the own choices that you make in your own life. Um, you can engage with the music that we're producing on this music project. We have artists that are Japanese artists that you may already be fans of. By supporting and reading that sort of material, like the material that we produce at the Ala Ocean Project, you are contributing to a more just and sustainable uh, ocean. Uh, with this, um, yeah, I just come back to Ian uh, for a final remarks um, before we conclude. And anything you'd like to convey, particularly to the Japanese audience uh, who are listening uh, to this uh, um, ocean forum? No, I mean, I would just say, I think Japan has a distinct history, both in terms of its fishery science, both in terms of its um, its management and policing of its own waters, um, and also just its consumption levels of seafood. Um, it is a uniquely um, sophisticated and invested um, country and culture in these issues. Uh, and also, so many of the most successful things that Japan has done, I think are worth the world watching uh, and learning from. Um, but I also think Japan has a really important role to play uh, in um, kind of always setting the best example on these issues as well and, and leading with new science and new policing and, and, and new research. So um, all things that you're already doing, but I would just say um, uh, it's, it's a great crowd to be um, talking to. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Ian, uh, for wrapping up, and uh, also thank you, um, uh, Ida san, Tamara san, and uh, Maso san, uh, for joining us, and also uh, Charlotte uh, to join us as well. Uh, so, this bring me, uh, bring us to conclude uh, today's sessions on the uh, IUU fishing, uh, in the uh, perspective from the front line of IUU fishing, international partnership, and challenges. I uh, thank you all uh, for joining us and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. At OPRI, uh, we distribute information about ocean policies from Japan and abroad, and also about changing international environment due to spread of COVID-19. The we intend to offer information from the perspective of the ocean uh, by publishing related observations, thoughts, as well as organizing events. Whenever you are interested, please take a look. Next Ocean Forum is scheduled in late March 2021. Details would be announced through our website or mail magazine. We are looking forward to have your participation again. Thank you.